Hello and welcome to the Rabbit Trail Podcast, episode 130. 130. There's the and. There you go. <laughs> You're probably missing a voice here. Greg's not with us today. He had a family emergency. He'll be okay, but he'll join us probably next week. But today I am here. My name is Stephen Oldham, the local outreach pastor here, but I'm not alone. Who am I with here today? You are with Brent Branshaw, the Connections Pastor here at Olive <laughs> Branch Church. And uh, and uh, he will... Uh, okay, let's start over. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, you, you can kick it back to me. I, you didn't do I your No, I was thinking so, you just kicked yeah, it back to me. Yeah, okay, I will kick point. it back. Uh, All right, you ready? Yeah. And See, I told you I'd get confused. <laughs> you don't deal well with change. <laughs> and three, two... Hello and welcome to the Rabbit Trail Podcast, episode number 130. 130. Yeah. There's one voice that you probably hear that is missing today, and that's Greg. He had a family. Wait, wait, wait. How can they hear a voice yeah. that is missing? You're, yeah, you're right. There is a voice <laughs> that isn't here that you probably remember hearing. Uh, he's not with us today. He had a family emergency, but me and Brent are here holding down the fort. Unfortunately, you have us two clowns while Greg is gone. So we'll yeah. see how this goes. But yeah, my name is Stephen Oldham. If you're wondering who I am, I'm the local outreach pastor here at Olive Branch. And you are? I am Brent Branch, and I am the Connections Pastor here at Olive Branch. Yes. And so <laughs> we are here today. We're going to talk about the sermon that happened last week. We're in Mark, right? Chapter 3, verse 7 through 12. But maybe you've had a question on this series. This is wrapping up a series that we've been doing for a while. Um, but maybe you have a question from last week. We talked about fasting or something else. So uh, if you do have questions, how do they how do they get them to us? Well, first off, I, I just want to just correct you again. You said you said oh, this is gonna be we are going to discuss the sermon from last week. Now, no, I didn't say we were going to. Biblically it. speaking, Sunday is the first day of the week, so it was actually this week the sermon that we are discussing, right? <laughs> so. Just, I just want to make sure that we're not talking heresy just because Greg's not here and we're staying biblically true to the, to the days of the week. But I am Brent Branshaw. I am the Connections Pastor. We would love to have you guys uh, make some comments, uh, fill us in, and send your questions to rabbittrail at obcc.church, rabbittrail at obcc.church. And we have a couple of them we're going to get to later on in the program, so... All right. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yes. And also, if you are watching, let us know where you're watching. Maybe you're watching us on YouTube or if you're listening to us on Apple or Spotify, make sure you like and subscribe in those venues. And then if you would be so kind as to share this with other people, let them know. That's how we get the word out. And we thank you guys for watching and listening. We have some great comments that come in and people that we get to talk to here at church. So it's been fun. All right. And uh, so we will get on it, and we don't have uh, Greg here to narrate and coach <laughs> us as to what segment we're in. But right now, we are going to tell some bad jokes. Oh, so, boy. yeah, that's yeah. right. This is the segment. So I will say, this one This one is for you because you are oh, a boy. Marvel guy. No. Oh, my gosh. I just committed comic blasphemy. <laughs> it is a DC joke. Oh, so, no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> You're already starting off wrong. I know, I know. I, cor you would correct me because I, I corrected you. So. Yes. What do you call Batman when he starts skipping church? Mm, what do you call Batman when he starts skipping church, Brent? Christian Bale. Oh, boy. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway, I ran into Debbie in the hallways, and she is always keen with a a, a a good joke. So when you hear the good <laughs> jokes, they're from Debbie. <clears throat> but she hit me up, and she told me this joke. I had heard it before, but I thought it was funny. So there's this old pastor, and he gets moved to this old country, small-town church. And the church was in a little bit of disrepair. So he found in the basement some cans of paint, so he thought, I'm going to, you know, I have a little bit of time. I'm going to paint the church. So he grabbed the paint and he went outside and popped open the lid and the bucket wasn't very full. And he realized, you know, as he started painting, there's not going to be enough paint for me to paint the whole outside of this building. So he started to water down the paint and continue painting. And then a little while later, he saw that he's going to run short again, so he added some more water and to continue painting. And all of a sudden, at that moment, 
these storm clouds came, the rains came pouring down, and a voice from the sky said, repaint and thin no more. Oh, boy. Oh, bada bing, bada boom. Thanks for that joke. Yeah. So <laughs> I thought that was a cute joke. So, um, But I do want to, um, before we get into the discussion on the um, uh, sermon. You want to apologize to Christian Bale? I don't. Oh, okay. I don't. <laughs> um, and uh, so so one of the things I uh, I was perusing YouTube um, and the rabbit trail, and because I was somebody asked me something. You're watching and, our own podcast. <laughs> you know, I I was, but he's I was a, watching a it. Fan. I was wor- watching it because I wanted to reference and kind of find the yeah. tam- the time stamp so I can send it to them and go. We talked about that here, so take a listen. Um, and as I was doing that, I noticed, you know, when you get the um, the YouTube thing, it has those thumbnails and yeah. it's like episode 126 and it has a, a beautiful picture of me or something, you know, and uh, <laughs> and then it has, you know, like what the subject was. Um, but when I was looking and it was episode number 128, mm. we are, it says, you know, discussing should a Christians fast, Okay. So 128, should Christians fast? It had my picture on there, <laughs> and then it said technical difficulties. Yeah. So my thought was, is was that a prank? Like, okay, it's about fasting. Number one, we should put the fat guy's picture on there <laughs> and then say technical difficulties, meaning it doesn't line up with the fat guy and the fasting. I want to be clear, is that a photo prank on me? Yeah, you are. you're asking the wrong person. You got to ask the tech people that. I will, because that is not kind. <laughs> I'm gonna I write just, him a letter. <laughs> I just want to say, yeah, i you know, I just thought it was just a regular comment about you in general. Technical I, difficulties. I'm gonna go back <laughs> and go to that, and then make some comments so that your first impressions next week can can uh, reference that, and we can let these tech boys know, hey, you can't be dogging on us, you know. <laughs> so. So anyway, that was just an aside. But we didn't really have any comments um, for your first impressions, but we did have a question. And so we'll tackle that at the end. Yeah, if someone that? wrote in a question, and I appreciate that. Yeah, that yeah, was a good question. Everything else, no one's written in anything yet. All right. Still, so, the, still the voting on the rabbit trail instead <laughs> of changing it. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> since Greg's not here today, we will probably be short. So... Uh, um, the sermon series we are in is mm. Follow Who, and, uh, and the topic was the King of Kings. So we want to follow the King of Kings. Um, and one thing that I thought was interesting that Greg brought up, because, uh, again, a lot of times I, I hear people criticizing the church and, you yeah. know, Christians are this and that, and they act like this and they act like that. And, and one of the things Greg was kind of differentiating between is— the crowds and the church and a lot of times they're judging the church and not not to say that the church doesn't make mistakes yeah and, and there are there are people within the church that is like you know okay hey you know we need to be more kind we need to be more loving um and we need to live it out a little more true um but there is a lot of times the church are getting lumped in with the crowd and yeah. so um, I like that idea that, the, you know, even like when Jesus was was teaching, there were the crowds, but then there were his followers, too. His disciples. Um, yeah. And so what how would you differentiate the two? Yeah, this comes out of the passage in Mark three. The sermon was on seven, verses seven through 12 there. And it's Jesus just talking about his he withdrew with his disciples to the sea and a great crowd, fo- crowd followed from the, the Galilee to Judea. And so then he gets in the boat and he has them prep the boat and then he talks to the crowd. But just the idea the crowd is coming to con- kind of like consume his message or usually they want a healing. They want to see what he's doing. He's the hot new thing. He's the hot news in the time. And so everybody's coming out. And I think there's a difference between exploring something because you have a, an appetite for it or a concern. And I think even his message you mentioned, a lot of times people come to church the first time. They don't come for the right reasons. And I think the difference is when you start to go like, what is this all about? 
to, you know what, I want to serve or I want to follow this, this Jesus and listen to what he has to say. And that separates the crowd. In fact, Jesus literally says, you know, hey, guys, you're my disciples. Go do this thing. And that's usually about the time where you start to realize that, okay, I'm not just watching and spectating. I'm actually participating. And so I think the difference between the crowd and, and, and uh, you know, the disi- his disciples is the willingness to follow and be committed to following when he asks you to do something. And the crowd is just there for their own interest to consume. Mm-hmm. It's a big problem in our culture today is that consumption is such a big thing. Like um, even people who come to church, you have to ask yourself, what am I getting out of this? And it's like, well, okay, that's not the only question. God puts them to work. He actually tells them to, to prep this boat and get ready because he's going to preach to that crowd. He's going to draw people out of the crowd to the discipleship. And I think that's what he wants us to help do. So, Yeah, and I mean, some of the, um, some of the language Greg used when he was describing the church, um, you know, and by the church we would say the true, true followers well, the of Jesus yeah. Christ. The family, um, you know, is number one. They were students of him. They wanted to learn. They wanted to. They followed to him. Grow. Uh, they were following him. That, um, you know, what he said. They were trying to live out. Um, they so they were striving. They were. Uh, they had an allegiance uh, to him. Um, and when Christ spoke, they moved. You know, um, when Christ gave a command, they they responded. They responded. And I, I have heard. I heard a pastor say once that I always, it always stuck with me, and I thought it was kind of profound. Was he said, you know, if you want to like examine where you are in your walk, or you know how how strong your faith is, is um, you can measure it to you know, and I mean this isn't like a real true uh, you know a scientific measure, study, <laughs> yeah, but the the time it takes between when God speaks. And you act, you know, that time, to- the, the longer the time, the less connected you are with with being a follower or, you know, following Christ. The more time <laughs> it takes probably shows an area of growth in your in your faith. Right. Yeah, yeah. we often think about these crowds because they're mixed crowds. So people have many different motives for being in the crowd. Some are actually genuinely seeking the truth. Some are curious. Some are just wanting to just be a part of a group of people for some reason because it's the hot new thing. But I will say, like, um, this happens also with Christian churches in general. When people go to a church for the first time, you're kind of feeling it out. You're listening. You're watching. But at some point, I think it's important, and this is where our kind of consumer culture kind of gets in the way, is you have to show your allegiance to that group and say, yeah, I'm a part of whatever you're doing. And I think that's at the point where most people, and it has nothing to do with salvation per se, but just whether you believe in the in the mission of that particular church, has to make a decision to be a loyal follower. And if the church asks you to do something, you would at least consider how you can participate in that. And I think the difference is if you come to church and just kind of sit there year after year after year, the question becomes, are you loyal to that group of people or are you still in the crowd? And what makes you different as a Christian sitting in a church from someone who's not a Christian sitting in the church and just curious? Mm. And I think the difference is whether you're willing to serve. And so what I liked about the sermon on this passage was that Jesus is asking them to do something. He, He says, I want you to prep the boat so I can talk to the crowd and talk to them about becoming a disciple. And if we're not prepping that boat, if we're not willing to participate in a church and we're just kind of sitting there, even in just our prayers, praying for the church, maybe you have a a busy job or something, but you need to actively show that you have some kind of skin in the game. And I think that's when people push back. And I think that's why churches like ours do membership and things to kind of see like, here's our vision, our mission. Are you willing to join us or you just kind of want to be part of that crowd? And I don't think you should ever like turn the crowd away for, per se, Jesus does do this after a period of time with this particular crowd, but I think there you're always trying to challenge that crowd to move into discipleship. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and um, you know, one of the things when I was putting together the new membership class uh, at the beginning of the year and kind of rewording things, one of the one of the things that I wanted to put in there and to say, and Greg was kind of like, "Eh, that's kind of stupid. Don't put that in there." Um, you know, and I asked a couple of people because I thought it was like, you know, <laughs> this is pretty profound, you know, and, uh, and everyone was like, yeah, no, nah, no. Nah. But it was the um, the idea of you can't serve without serving, you know, without doing. <laughs> yeah. You know, and and the idea behind what, what behind that thought was a lot of people 
kind of have an attitude of, yeah, I want to serve my church or, you know, I am serving my church, but they're not serving, you know? Yeah, they're attending. Yeah, and it's like you can't serve, and, you know, we have been commanded to serve one another and care for one another. In fact, you know, um, I think, you know, Christ, I don't know if it's Christ, but it might have been Paul. It's just like if you're doing good outside in, you know, outside of the church, that's good, but be do more good for those inside the household of the faith because yeah, then people know? want to stay if they become a, yeah. a part of the church i think the problem is with the word membership it's we, we probably need a better word besides well, member i think we are going to re, you know re uh readdress that and and we're i think we're going to change the terminology to partnership rather than membership yeah because it's a two-way streak i think we want to help you but we want to know that you'll help help the church grow by talking to your neighbors or just being involved in the mission and I think membership sounds like I'm signing up for something that I have to give my life away. Just recently, uh, somebody uh, w- went to a restaurant, a family went to this restaurant in, on a Disneyland property, and they, um, they told them, like, hey, man, I have these allergies, and, uh, you, know, I can't, um, you know, I can't eat certain things because I'm very allergic. And they're like, oh, no, it's fine. And they gave them that thing, and the person passed away. Mm. And so the, the family is suing Disney, but they said because they went on to Disney Plus and filled out the sign for a free membership, mm. that, that they can't, they have to go to an arbitrator. They can't actually do it. And they're like, what does the restaurant have anything to do with me signing the paperwork? And so people are always wondering, am I signing my firstborn away when I'm clicking this little button for Apple Plus or something like that? Literally, they were trying to use that as an excuse to get out of a lawsuit for this. And so I think that's kind of the approach people have to church when they hear the word membership. It's like, you got me. What am I? What do I get out of this? It feels like you're trying to control me. And I understand that caution from the church. But I think you still can't get past the question of, are you a member sitting in a church and not doing anything but just listening? Or are you actively participating? What does that loyalty look like? Mm-hmm. So if the if we feel like the Lord is leading our church to do something and you're just like, nah, I don't feel it this week, is that really the kind of thing that makes you kind of loyal to the mission? And so part of the idea of the classes is to I- introduce to you the material so you can at least think about it, at mm-hmm. least kind of be exposed to it. And I think that's what Jesus is doing through these sermons. He's exposing people to the gospel. Um, it's different because we're talking about salvation in the sense of God wants you to be salvation, but it also is just about your life mission as well. So he is asking people to join what will become the church in some sense, and it's the first time. And, and he is dis- differentiating the crowd from, from the, the people who are disciples. And right. so that, the only way I can see you doing that is to say, I'm loyal to whatever Jesus asked me to do. And some people he asked to follow tightly, and they had to give up their whole entire day and life. Others, he said, yeah, you're a follower of me, but go and do the thing that you're going to do. And so not everyone followed him around, but he had a larger group than the 12. And so I don't think it's a matter of like, you have to give up everything to do this thing, but just a matter of how can you show your loyalty to God? in your local body. That's why I think we have all these freedoms to go to a church, pick one that you think you can really invest in and really start to kind of participate with and be loyal to. So I, I don't I think it's good to change the membership thing where you might end up, you know, in a lawsuit with Disney yeah. <laughs> um, you know, for that, signing the terms of agreement for, for Disney Plus. <laughs> yeah, and for those of you that have taken the membership class, I'm not sure if you really read the small print because no, it, was, you give away it was really like you really couldn't see it there. You, you know, uh, you had to hold it up to a black light and everything. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you have uh, signed away more rights than you believe. So, yeah, so I'll be kidding. taking your car for but, a spin. But, you know, I think membership <laughs> is just kind of a universal term that, you yeah. know, especially it's, with church, that, it's you know, it's been a part of the, the verbiage forever. Yeah. So I think it's kind of the easy way to go, okay, you know, are you a member of the church? Um, and uh, It just means and, something and different so, but now. partnership, I, I like that, too, because it's kind of that idea that we're partnering together. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times people are like, why do I need membership? You know, I'm committed, you know, I'm committed to the church. And to me, part of part of membership, number one, is alignment, because people go to church for different reasons. And it's just a reminder of why we're here, you know, as a local church, why we exist, uh, and just making sure everybody is on board with understanding why we're here. We're not just here for all these different reasons. We're here for a specific reason, and that is to evangelize and to disciple. Um, but the other side of it, too, is to to really kind of understand who is partnering with us. And I, I will say, it's it's hard to just go to a church and then go, 
oh yeah, I'm committed to that church, when you haven't really heard or understood what the vision and the mission of that church is, what the structures are in order to accomplish that, what are the strategies to accomplish that mission, and 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 having that understanding and then going, okay, I'm committing to all those things to further the gospel. And so I think I think church membership is important or partnership is important for that reason. But also it helps us to identify who is you know, and I don't want to use the the followers versus the crowd mentality because I do think yeah, it's, it's people can be followers and not be members, and they can be saved and not be members. Right. But, but it's helping us to identify who are those people that are like, yes, I am on board with partnering, you know, and and driving the mission and the vision forward and taking responsibility for that too. And and then who are just here to um, to to get fed and and to or to listen forward. and yeah, yeah. yeah. To, to to mull things over you know and I I will say like in with Jesus um, the crowds versus his followers or disciples you know I mean again part of the crowd you know um, a lot of times they want the rewards or you know the without the commitment. You know, yeah, that's a I mean, typical American response as well. Yeah, and Jesus, I and I, I, this is when I wish I had a computer in front of me so I can get the right language in it. But you know, when when Jesus was talking and he said, many of these people are here just for the signs and the miracles. As John you know, six, and basically yeah. they're not really here to be followers. You know, they're just here for the excitement and you know and the grandeur. You know, um, and and so he was kind of showing that that yeah they're interested they want to see these things they want to have these experiences but they're really not at that point that they're ready to lay down their life pick up their cross and to follow me yeah. correct yeah is in john chapter six where you have a similar crowd and jesus is talking to them I, he says very rarely i i say to you truly truly i say to you you are looking for me not because you, you saw the signs I performed, but because you are uh, you ate the loaves and had your fill. Yeah. <laughs> so the idea is still like do not uh, do not work for food that spoils, but work, uh, but for food that endures to eternal life, which is the Son of Man will give you. For on Him God and the Father has placed His seal of approval. So to me, it's kind of like um, if I have to watch it. It's just like an American thing. You're like, what am I getting out of this? And then is someone taking advantage of me? Those two things there. You have to have a little bit of faith in God using people. And I think that's the hard jump for a lot of people to be a part of a local body is they, they, they haven't built enough relational connection to the congregation to feel like, okay, I can trust that they're following the Lord or whatever. And I, I don't think you're ever going to get around, you know, human people being fallible. Mm. But you have to trust that God uses fallible people to accomplish the things he wants to do. And if something presents itself, you know, you have way more choices than in the ancient world, where if something happened in the church, you had to solve it because mm -hmm. you couldn't really pick up and move. And so they were having to be loyal. But so if you are loyal to a group of people for a period of time, I think you will see a change in your connection to that congregation. I know for me, it takes about three years to feel connected to people in a church, but another three to kind of be like, OK, I'm going to jump all in for ministry. Um, but in then even then you're volunteering for things, trying to get to know people. And I, I value those people who've gone through that process. And then I think their complaints and their concerns, I'm more willing to listen to because, and I go out of my way to help because those are the people who've sacrificed. And um, and I'm like, yeah, we're fall we're falling in this area, but we're trying. And so please have some grace or something like that. But um, but someone who's just like, I'm suspicious no matter what, and I don't trust anyone. I don't know how you get past that without thinking that the Lord can use fallible people, including me mm -hmm. or you or someone else. So. And I will say one, I, yeah, I mean, there is that natural part that, you know, maybe you're not going to get over it completely. But I do feel as though um, one way you you start moving toward that um, is is getting to know people. You yeah. Know? Getting to know people. Um, and that's why, you know, Greg also talks about um, sharing the gospel. Um, and and again, sharing scriptures, sharing the gospel, um, talking about your faith. Um, you know, it's one thing when you're talking about that with fellow believers that are that are followers of Christ. It's another thing when you're talking to people who are part of the crowd or not even part of the crowd, you know, just kind of <laughs> yeah. the outside. 
but they're you know they're curious and so part of it is as you are sharing the gospel you know just having an understanding of where they're at you know um are they asking questions but they really have no desire to hear an answer they're just scoffers you know um and i would say you know yeah share the gospel with them but don't don't beat yourself up that you know that it's it's a adversarial you know as long as you are conducting yourself in a respectable manner um but then you've got like say in in the workplace you know and and i used to uh manage restaurants or manage uh oil distribution um company warehouse at one point and and there was a lot of guys there that were not christians you yeah know? and some of them kind of believed some of them didn't really believe um but i didn't not share my faith with them you know yeah. i would i would share my beliefs they knew what my beliefs were they knew where my standards were and you know i would hang out with them sometimes after work for a little bit but they knew where my lines were um and i had had some conversations with them and and a lot of times they didn't go very far but i will say this too um when you are sharing your faith understand this it's not always an immediate impact, you know? Mm. And so don't always expect, you know, oh, I shared the faith I shared faith with them and they didn't fall to their knees and give God thanks. Um and so it was all for naught because it's not. A lot of times you're communicating something to them and then at a time when they find themselves in crisis or in need, um oftentimes they come back to you. You know, and I mean, yeah. they might not truly believe in God. They may not truly believe in the power of prayer, but they know that you believe those things and they'll ask you, can you pray for my family? Hmm. Can you play, pray for so-and-so? They're really going through something. Or if they have some questions and they respect your lifestyle, they will come to you and go, okay, how do you deal with these things? So people often ask me different area of raising kids and marriage and you know what yeah. are my thoughts on these things and and I think a lot of that came from the fact that I shared my faith they knew I was a believer and they knew that I had certain values that that maybe they respected even though they didn't agree with you know yeah I think it's a lot of the thing is is sometimes we follow the crowds home <laughs> in the sense that you live and sometimes in the crowd and how you respond in that crowd is interesting. Jesus is concerned for the crowd. Even when he's rebuking them in John 6, he spent time feeding them mm -hmm. and talking with them. So he's willing to do life and be who he is around them to get them to respond. And some of them respond negatively. And so if they're going to respond negatively to Jesus, they're probably going to respond that way to us. And so sometimes you have to just realize, I just want to be obedient and mm -hmm. care, kind, but truthful and stern when necessary, but loving. Uh, for the sake of persuading them towards the truth of the gospel. And um, I think that's what God will hold you accountable for. I, I don't know. I know there are people who want all these outcomes to happen, but like you said, that's just not always how life brings it out. But also, I think it took me a while because a lot of times Christians are like, well, I don't want to offend and I don't want to push my faith on anyone. The problem with that is like they will definitely tell you what they believe about life. <laughs> like I don't think people have a problem in our generation telling you about life so much once you start to get to know someone now maybe some people are sk skittish they don't talk about things because we live in a volatile world then it is kind of hard to figure out what does this guy really believe but i think it's if it's okay to have people say well i'm listening to you and res respecting you as a person as you're talking to me then it's okay for me to talk about what i think because that's how human beings interact with a certain mutual respect so if you want to be my friend or even get to know me on a personal level you're going to have to contend with my faith at some point because it's a part of who i am mm -hmm. and if you're okay with that then i'm okay with hanging out with you and so that's typically how friendships work but we're so polarized in our world that we can't hear anything negative we think that total acceptance of another person's view is the only way to love and I don't see Jesus doing that. I think he loves everybody, but he's very truthful, even with his own disciples. Mm -hmm. And his rebukes are meant to strengthen people, not to hurt them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And, uh, you know, it. I think it's important, too, that, you know, kind of what, what you were saying, Stephen, is, is the idea that w we as Christians, we feel as though we, well, we know we have a message um, that is life changing. It is eternity altering. 
Um, and so we want people to care what we think. We want people to care about what we believe and why we believe it. And we do need to show the other people the same respect. You know, we need to genuinely care about what they believe. And we need to genuinely care about why they believe that. Otherwise, um, it, it really is not a relationship. You know, you can care for somebody that that is not a believer, that doesn't share your values, and you can genuinely care for them and care for their soul and, and want to know them better because part of knowing them better also helps you understand how you can communicate the truth to them in a way that they will receive it, you know? Yeah, you know, I think the big, big misconception is if you don't have, if you have people in your life, they always have to be, say kind things to you, as, and that's how somehow the most loving thing. I actually think some of the best people in my life have said things I don't like hearing, mm. you know, and pointed them out because they care about me. Uh, and they care about me more. I mean, there's a passage that says, uh, I think it says, um, it's in Proverbs where it says, uh, profuse are the kisses of an enemy, but faithful are the wounds of a friend. Mm. And the idea is that, you know, people will flatter you all day long. And typically that person doesn't care about you because if they're only saying positive things to you, either I have a problem because, you know, I can't accept anything negative about myself or they don't really care enough about me to say like, you know, I see this in you and I really want to challenge you to grow. And those are the best points in my life. I don't think I would have lost the weight if there weren't a few friends in my life that were really going to go, yeah, you're, you, I can help you with this. They weren't just telling me what the doctors were, which is, you're going to die, which is not helpful, mm -hmm. but really telling me, like, I think you can do this, and I, I think you have to confront it. And that was helpful for me. Um, in, and not only I think you can do this, but let me show you how. Yeah, yeah, they got into my life, and... That helped a lot, you know, and uh, I don't think enough people realize that that is love, that people don't have to accept everything about me. I could have said, well, how dare you not love me the way I am? It's like, well, I care about you as a person, who you are, because you're creating the image of God. But for me to say that continue to hurt yourself or to continue to do something or not even have a conversation about it, um, that's not love, you know, and you don't want that because you, you'll always tear yourself apart because you're always wondering if people are lying to you or not giving you the information. And I think people live in that manic state, and it's not good for your mind to always be affirmed constantly. You get a little narcissistic, but also you, you have really dark moments when people don't have anyone honest in their life because mm -hmm. we all know we have blind spots. And if we don't have anyone in our life to tell us we have blind spots, then we have to tell everybody else that, that I have to make my own reality, and that's exhausting having to make sure everyone is lining up with what you think and then because other people have competing thoughts so if everybody thinks that way i need reality to conform to me then everyone is just going to fight because somehow the facts are going to come into in, into play and someone's thoughts are going to be different from mine and we're going to have to fight over what reality we're trying to forge and so to me it's best to let the true reality of things uh, dictate things that's why in christianity jesus is telling them the truth and he's loving and there's a standard there that people are being held to that all of us are in submission to. And I think that helps us grow is because we're bending our self, disciplining ourselves towards a particular direction of truth. And that's what really good therapy does. Like a lot of people say, well, what's therapy? If I affirmed a psycho killer, that would probably not be good for him or anyone else he harms. So if I say, well, you're a great person, just don't listen to anything anyone says. And he's like, okay, you know, that's not good. And so you have to be able to like, believe that people can be better and in order for people to be better than they are you have to believe that they're not as good as they could be mm. and that's the thing no one wants to say like you can't grow unless you are less than what you could be mm. and so you have to really challenge yourself am i a person who can't hear anything negative ever and, uh, and use it to grow um, i think there's a difference between just being negative and really challenging yourself to listen to the truth and let that be what you submit yourself to this is why i think jesus is so valuable as a christian because i can submit to him because he has my best interests at heart and um i think the thing that god does is you run up against that and you want to run as your first defense you want to hide and i think that's always how it's been all the way back to adam and eve you know you sin you want to hide and then blame somebody else i got to change the reality it's not my fault it's it's her fault or the devil's fault and God's just asking you the question, what, what did you do? Uh, because he wants you to live in the truth. So I think that's hard. It's hard for all of us. But that's what it means to join Jesus is to submit and say, you know what? Uh, not my will, your will be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of, the, one of the things in that 
that growth area that you were talking about that Nancy and I always, when we were doing premarital counseling, talked to the couples and said, you know, I think one important thing to always remember in a marriage relationship is always wear two hats, you know, wear the hat of a diligent teacher. I want to teach you how to love me better. I want to teach you how to be a better spouse. I want to teach you how to be a better parent. And, you know, so I want to help coach and teach you. Um, and then the other hat is I want to always have the hat on of a diligent student, you know, an eager student, because I want to learn how to love you better. I want to learn how to be a better husband. I want to learn how to be a better father. And and so, again, if you're wearing that cap of being an eager student, then those teaching moments don't come off as criticisms of your character as much as a learning opportunity of growth, you know? And so if you get into that, if you get into the mode of like, no, I'm good enough, then everything sounds like criticism and you're going to fight and rebel and get stubborn about it and dig your heels in. But if you have that idea of, oh no, I, I, there's always room to grow and be better, then, then it comes as a learning opportunity and, and you're, you welcome it more. Now, I'm not saying then in practice that always works out perfectly yeah, no, for hard. us. Um, you know, um, and I will say, you know, uh, maybe not uh, not don your teaching cap so much when when you are in the middle of uh, of a lot of tension and <laughs> conflict. You know, save those for the, the time in, when things are going good. But again, just that mentality, I think you, you kind of know that we become such a narcissistic um, culture that it's like you can't tell me anything anymore. Yeah, the, the dark side of narcissistic tendencies is it does come with a with a dark side in the sense that you when you're by yourself in those lonely moments you can't handle it. It's you have to constantly have a stimulus or something because if you self evaluate at any point you're going to realize you're not as probably great as you think you are, and you can't do that so you push it out to the world. See, Jesus is asking us to submit that to us. Put put down yourself and serve me. And only he's the perfect person, the one who didn't make any mistakes. And so you need that surrender and put down before you can actually start living a better life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's hard. And you saw that, like we were talking about John, where Jesus has a different crowd. In John, he actually says, they go, well, give us this bread. He's like, I, I you know, there's the bread of life. They will, you never hunger. You guys keep looking for bread. And he's like, I'm the bread of life. And they're like, what this is crazy we're just walking away and so you get to that point where you're not feeding me anymore and you're not surrender. he's like surrender to me i'll give you life and they're like no i want i wanted what this was cool for a while but now it's not cool and yeah you're asking me to submit my will to yours and i'm not going to do that and so that's when crowds start to pull away and i think all of us have those different areas of our life where we're not ready to submit that to the lord so and i do feel like the crowd too at some point is just um they're not going to bend, you know, they're not going to. Some people to, will in that crowd you know, not bend, yeah. And, um, you know, and, and they get this, this stubbornness and it's just like, well, this is who I am. Take it or leave it, you know? <laughs> and it's like, that's not a, that's not a growth statement. You know, <laughs> that, that is a stubborn um, statement. And, and so again, if, if you, if you catch yourself going, well, that's just who I am, you know, Okay, maybe there is a part in your DNA that 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 leans toward that, but we can't give in to that part of our DNA. You know, we need to always be wrestling. You know, and I loved somebody. Um, uh, it was a pastor, I think, that was telling um, a story about he was talking to his kid, and his kid was kind of coming of that age where he was going to make a statement of faith or not and he's like but dad i don't know if i can believe this for the rest of my life you know and his dad said i'm not asking you to believe this for the rest of your life i'm asking you to wrestle with this for the rest of your yeah. life. yeah you know to wrestle with your faith for the rest of your life and not become complacent and just be stagnant you know, I want you to grow and evolve and wrestle with your faith. Which is funny because the ancient Israelites, the name Israel means to wrestle with God. Mm -hmm. So you, you submit at some point, but you still are wrestling out that submission. And I think we, you made an important statement there. Wrestle with God, not against God, yeah. you know. And so, again, part of it is wrestling our flesh 
with God and not wrestling with God. Well, I know the Bible says this, but yeah, I'm I'm wrestling against God because I don't want to do that. No, part of that is bringing your will under the control of the spirit in order to please God. Yeah, I mean, the people think, well, why do you want to be religious? Because they that's, I think, the scariest part is submission to God. They're like, what does that mean? I'm like, look, everybody submits themselves to some kind of a standard, whether they like it or not. The standard is either me, which feels free, but it's actually not, um, or to whatever you've collected in your life, you know, and those those things are uh, your things in your past or whatever. Like, but everybody is submitting to a standard. So they often say that like, you know, Christianity is a crutch. And I'm like, well, what's your crutch? Because it's some people, it's alcohol, drugs, sex. It's always something that you're leaning on that you believe in or that helps you get through the day. And and the difference is, is that thing really strong enough to sustain you through eternity, through life? Does it really is it really good? And you have to really examine, what do I lean on when I have problems? Is it money? Is it, is it you know, myself? Or is it, what am I hiding is the other thing? What do I don't want people to see? Mm-hmm. And the thing about Christ is you can submit completely to Christ, and he sees everything already. And I think that's, you're just embarrassed. And I think once you get through that embarrassment, you start to feel like, okay, God does really care about me. Because even in my worst moments, he's still trying to get me to be better than what I think I can be. It's when you attack him because you just refuse to submit that you become your own God. And that, I think that's a lonely place, really, in the end. And I do feel, you know, and a warning, and, and the Bible warns us against it, too, is is submitting to our own desires, you know. Um, and because... If there's anything I've learned or witnessed in life is your desires, as you feed them, are never satisfied. You know? Yeah. They want They're more empty. and more and more. And it's not like you just reach this quota where you're like, okay, I'm I'm good. It, you your your desires are insatiable and it will drive you down a road of destruction. Um and uh, when they, when they're not healthy desires and and so we do need to wrestle with god against many of our natural desires because we are naturally born in sin and naturally in that we are enemies of god and so we need to wrestle to become friends of god and children of god so yeah a good, good sermon. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things, too, when it comes to sharing your faith with the crowds, um, getting to know them, getting to care about them, getting to understand them, um, it gives you an opportunity then to invite them in to the church or invite them in to a small group. Um, and maybe, you know, the church or something is doing a, is doing a, a a conference on parenting and you know that you know they've got kids and they're struggling or or marriage or you know other things that might be an interest of them that they can get some tools and get equipped and get some um some knowledge based you know things that they can put into practice in their family to help their family get healthy uh your small groups too so maybe you're doing a topical study and and you're thinking, I would like to just invite them for this study. Um, one of the things um, years ago, there was a couple. Um, uh, well, I didn't know the couple. I knew her. She started coming to Olive Branch, and she she signed up for the starting point class. And it was like right when we started the starting point class. <laughs> and she'd never been to Olive Branch. She just came across something. And we, you know, and we advertised it. And so she signed up for it and she came to starting point for 10 weeks. And one of the statements she made as they as everyone takes a week and shares their story to one of the things she was saying was her and her husband were pretty much atheists and they thought Christianity was foolishness and their kids were pretty young, you know, at the time. And they thought Christians were, you know, foolish they made fun of christians all the time um and and they really had no tolerance for christians and christianity and she reached a point where she's like because i think she grew up hearing about god and everything and she came to a point where it's just like i need to examine whether or not god is real you Hmm. know and so she signed up for the starting point class 
um, because it kind of goes over the overarching themes of the Bible, and it's a place that you can ask questions and everything else. And at the end of that, she gave her life to the Lord. Now, her husband was still an atheist, you know, Um, but he he was a loving husband who supported his wife, so he wasn't going to ridicule her for her newfound belief, but he wasn't really that interested in following that but so she started going to church she joined our small group and we you know i think the first thing we went through the book of acts or something and she sat through that and then we decided we were going to do financial peace university Uh as a small group and and she had mentioned that they were struggling financially and everything else and i said why don't you invite your husband to participate in our small group Um, for these 13 weeks that are Financial Peace University. Let them know it's not overly Christian. It's not like a Bible study. You know, we're just going to learn about, you know, godly principles, about handing money and everything else. And so he came for the 13 weeks. He really connected with the group. He really liked the people. And then at the end of the group, he was planning on coming back. And I said, hey, we're going to study the book of James, you know, starting next week. And I said, I would love to invite you to just sit through the book of James. And um, and because here's the thing we would, you know, if you don't mind, you know, yeah. I would love to hear when we are making points and having discussions. Um, I would love to hear your perspective as an atheist. Yeah. You know. And, you know, what are some of your concerns? What are some of your pushbacks on this? You know, I would love to have that discussion. And so he's like, eh, I don't know. I'll think about it. But he did. He went through the book of wow. James and then stayed with our small group for probably two, three years. Wow. And um, it, he didn't really give his life to Christ. And the one hump that he just couldn't get over was the miracles. Mm. You know, he you know, he's, I, I'm scientific in mind, and I sure. just can't get past the miracles. And so he gave him books on miracles and all this stuff. But he never really gave his life to Christ uh, that I know of. But the one thing it did, it gave him a completely different perspective on Christians and Christianity. Yeah. To the point that he invited his daughter uh, from a previous marriage, uh, and she lived out of state, and she was staying with him. She Im- He invited her to our Bible study and and then we prayed you know and he had asked for prayer for something so we prayed and they got in the car and she was like why would you do that dad why would you why would you ask them for prayer when you don't believe in God and you don't believe in prayer Hmm. and he goes but they do you know they do and it shows me that they care about me and they love me and these are good people and they're not like, you know, trying yeah. to. And so it changed his perspective. So when people are like arguing that the church is full of haters, part of that is I don't think they've been in the proximity right. of the church, the true followers who are really trying to live this out with grace and mercy and tenderness. And there are a lot of people who are like that that I find that even Christians because they feel like they're going to be judged will automatically assume that. And sometimes I find that I've asked non-Christians if they want prayer and they're totally fine with it. And so I think having more conversation, a part of being Christian isn't just trying to get people to join the church and sign up on the dotted line. Part of it is really just to seek the welfare of the place that you're living in. I mean, a lot of scriptures talk about seek the welfare of the city. And um, so it's we like to talk about not, not just about the gospel, but a part of the gospel is talking about doing good and loving other people and why those biblical principles are so solid and found in uh, in our society today and so if someone's willing to have a conversation about faith or about uh principles on parenting or other, the, the church offers a lot in that regard to make society a better place but ultimately in the end it is submission to the lord but it doesn't mean that we can't have interfaith conversations i think we ne- would love to go back to pre 2019 2018 pre-covid pre a lot of political stuff and have those open conversations I had a lot more relationships back then than I do now. And I miss those conversations about faith and hearing just other people's perspectives on life. And I think that's what I like about Jesus. He's just walking through crowds and everyone has from Romans to people from outside the city to Jews from different parts to Galileans. They all had conversations about faith. And I, I love that about Christ. He's able to do that. And so it's interesting to watch how he treats a crowd. Um, 
and it's it's just fascinating how how much he's able to show his love, but yet show his show the truth and share and share what is the truth. So, yeah. All right, you got any more? No, I think All that's right. good. So I think we got a couple of questions, and one of them I'm not sure 100 percent if it's a question or a statement. We'll see if we can but, answer them, right? But uh, um, the question the the email said, "Hi guys." I enjoyed your Sabbath discussion. Hmm. May I bring to the table the idea that the Hebrews begin and end their day at sundown. Hmm. They begin their day with rest and awaken to see what God has prepared for them that day in labor. It would seem that this way of thinking, God is even in our day putting rest first. Westerners begin their day with labor at sunrise and then rest at sundown perhaps in prayer for anything they missed in what God had in mind for their day. It could be said, we put our labor as a priority. Just an idea brought out by the teaching of Christy McClelland. I hope I restated the idea correctly. Have a God-filled, fabulous day, Sue. So what say you, Stephen? Yeah, the idea of Sabbath does, I mean, in the Bible, days start in the evening a lot. So they, they go from evening to evening. Our culture does have the opposite kind of approach. We start from morning to morning. Um, and I, I do think there's something to be said that if you change the pattern of your mind to think that the evening is where my day starts, that perhaps that might lead to some more spiritual disciplines. But um, I think it is nice to see that there is a dis- different cultural shift. I think our culture does put work first and... and, and uh, but I, I don't know if they put rest second. I think most people are working to get to the weekend, and that's how they think of it. They think of, I got to work to the weekend, and then I, and then I just got to get through this week. Whereas I do think there's something to say, but God's like, you know what? Rest with me. Put me first. So even if you don't do the principle of doing the evening first and preparing for that time to rest, um, that it, you at least uh, think about him first when you start your day. So if you're getting up in the morning, I notice that when I get out of bed, if I'm not thankful for another day, if I don't start my day with prayer, if I don't start my day with something of, either from the scriptures, that I'm actually a worse person without two or three hours in, I start to realize my, my mood is worse and things are worse. So I do think it's good to start your day with putting God in the right place and making sure he's He's the, the day. Like, oh, I wasn't really promised this day. And so, Lord, help me make this day everything you want it to be. And then what I like to do is, if I'm if I'm on my game, I don't always do this, but I try to, like, do it throughout the day. So in the morning, Lord, help me do what you'd like me to do. What good could I do today? How can I serve you, honor you? Help me to be the best I can in whatever I do today. And then at lunchtime, ask for how am I doing? And then in the evening, kind of think through, like, what do you want for the next day? But also, how was this day and what were the blessings in it? Um, that's a habit I've tried to form. I'm not always good at it, but I think it has helped me. But in the morning, if I don't do that, it's pretty, pretty bad. Because I'm just thinking about myself, <laughs> how much pain my back's in or something like that. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, the, the comment that we do begin our day with labor, um, and labor is our priority, I know I wrestle with that a lot uh, because I like to try to have a quiet time in the mornings mm. you know just a I'm little a bit of person. a prayer and um and uh and just a little bit of scripture reading uh do a little devotional um and i often go okay i'm gonna come in to work a little bit early and i'll you know spend some time doing that and inevitably I go, well, let me just check my email first. And then I do that, and then I'm in work <laughs> mode and labor mode. And and so it is so easy to prioritize labor over time with the Lord, for sure. Um, and you do you do just have to be diligent about doing it. And, uh, um, and, and I'm not as diligent as I would like to be. Um, it's not a bad I'm idea. I'm hoping to grow. And I will say, Greg and, and Justin, uh-huh. um, my office is so small compared to theirs, um, but uh, but one of the things that they do that I am going to try to organize my office and set up set this up for myself somehow is they have different stations in their office where like if they're sitting at the desk that's work mode and if they're sitting like Justin has a chair in the corner oh. and that's his quiet time and his study time so a lot of times I'll come in in the morning and he's got his back to the door and he's sitting in his chair and he's re- got the scriptures open and I'm just like good boy you know <laughs> um you know and then and Greg has 
that chair in his office yeah. behind his door. He's got his desk that he works at, and then he's got the conference table. So conference table is for meetings. The chair is for you know reading and studying, and his desk is for writing sermons and and uh, um, and studying. So I am <laughs> working, but you know I I I get that compartmentalizing, and when you are in that compartment, you're kind of training your mind to be in a certain place you know and i really like that idea so well the idea of starting your day for the next day in the evening is not a bad idea if you think about okay what do i want tomorrow before you go to bed then you you're saying lord i just give my day to you i'm going to rest and then you get up i wonder if that changes i haven't really done it that way before you know, uh, I, I could see where that would help if you really planned out your day the day before and had everything settled. Because yeah. if not, when, it, when with God when, at least, yeah, when work is chaos, you know, and I've got so many things going all at one time, constantly, I'm working up at two o'clock in the morning, and my mind will not shut up. You know, it's just you got to do this. Don't forget this. I'm doing, and it's like I hope you remember this when you get in the office tomorrow, and. I can't sleep, and I end up getting up at three, four o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and and I'm just stressed and overwhelmed and tired. And it would be like I feel like if I if I get in the habit of just reviewing the day, looking forward to what I have to do tomorrow, and then putting that to rest, I could rest more peacefully. You know? Yeah, I've noticed as I've gotten older, routines are are becoming more inevitable. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. And then we did have a question. So we were looking at the comments to see if we had any uh, in, nasty comments that we can deep do, dive a, into do the our internet. first impressions. Mm-hmm. And we didn't, but we had a good question. So You have that question or you want me to read it? Uh, you go ahead and read it if you got it right there. If not, I can do my best. I can look it up. I mean, basically, um, whoever it was, um, was was making the comment... Um, and I don't know if it had a, 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 a final point or not, but he was just saying that he wants to read, but his flesh doesn't. So I can read I'm, it if you want. Okay, yeah, go for it. So this is from um, Josh B913. Uh, uh, it's a public comment. So I want to read, but my flesh does not. Uh, I've never liked reading. I, w- I want to fast, but my flesh does not. And I have no self-discipline. I want to give, but my finances are kind of rough right now. Does that does not make me? Does, I think you meant that. Does that make me unsaved? The flesh wants one thing, and the spirit wants another. Okay. Then I would say number one, no, it does not make you unsaved. I mean, because obviously you're desiring the things that God wants you to desire. You know, you want, you know, study His Scripture, read His Word, you know, delight in His Word. Um, you know, and you're wrestling with your flesh toward those things. So um, you want to fast. You want to honor God. You want to make a sacrifice and to, to where you are, you know, training your body to worship the Lord and, and remind you. And you want to give and be generous in that. But right now your finances are, um, are, are difficult for you to do that. So your heart is in the right place. And you'd mentioned your flesh, um, and uh, and I think you mentioned self discipline, um, and and I will say that keep wrestling. You know, I mean, those things that you are desiring are good things to desire, and I mean, even Paul at one point, the things I desire to do, I don't do; the things that I don't want to do, I do do, do do. I yeah. said do do. Um, you did. You know, I would think Paul's <laughs> saved. You know. Um, and and so again, I think number one, you mentioned self control uh, and discipline, and I will say that self control is a fruit of the spirit. You know, and one of the things I always talk about when it comes to the fruits of the spirit is it depends on f- the fruits of the spirit are evident, and it's in Galatians chapter five, verse twenty-two. And but if you're led by the spirit, you're not into the law and out of the flesh. And it goes to the the fruits of the flesh and fulfilling the flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. And so 
bringing your desires under the control of the spirit rather than the control of the flesh is a fruit of the, the spirit. And I like to think of that as a maturity issue, you know, uh, for a large part. We had a lemon tree in our backyard because Nancy's dad brought over a little twig that he cut off his tree, planted it in our backyard because Nancy wanted a lemon tree. And that tree grew to be a big, beautiful, healthy tree. And it produced no fruit. Mm. And after like five years, I'm like, I'm cutting this sucker down because it's not producing fruit. It's a worthless lemon tree. And then that year, it exploded with fruit. And it just... It hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it didn't. It didn't because, you know, my wife likes lemons. So. Uh-huh. But, um, and it's been a great tool to hand out to the neighbors yeah. and get to know the neighbors. And um, But um, but the one thing it, it taught me is... Fruit comes when the tree is mature, you know, and and I'm just rem- remembering like early in your faith and and you might have been a Christian for 10 or 15 years, but you might still be in that early process of your faith. Um, and and in that time, the roots are growing to nourish the tree to be able to sustain that fruit. So don't beat yourself up just because the fruit isn't as evident as you want it to be the desire is there and when it starts matching up with the um your self-control and your discipline and and really becoming a fruit of the spirit is when you're going to really explode you know in your faith um and again part of i think with debt you know i mean when i first gave my life to the lord we were in debt and couldn't really give um and i think Part of part of the problem with debt sometimes sometimes it's you know your finances you know you you don't have enough income and you have to survive, but the other side of it is a lot of times debt is because of your lack of self control when it comes to spending. I want something I don't want to wait and save up for it. I'm going to buy it now, and then you put yourself indebted, which puts pressure on your finances, which. When you want to be generous, it makes it difficult to be generous because you've been too generous to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's an interesting question because, like, I, I honestly don't know you. So I think part of the, the, the tricky little problem with self-discipline, you say you have no self-discipline, is you can't really do it on your own. Very, very often right. are you able to do that on your own. So I do think the reason why God saves us, if you gave your life to the Lord, you accepted that you, you, know, you can't do it on your own, and you submit to the Lord, he puts you in a church family. And so oftentimes, if you're feeling like you have no self-control, you need to tell someone else, I have no self-control, hold me accountable. Um, because the last thing you want to do is there's a difference between wrestling with, with your flesh and accepting it. If you do accept your flesh over God, then you do love yourself more than God. And then I would say your salvation's in danger. I don't know you, so I wouldn't know, I wouldn't be able to say this about anyone in particular. Uh, but there's a difference between like wrestling and acceptance. So if I if there was with friends, we would talk about we had accountability group. My friend would say, "I don't wrestle with this anymore. I just accepted it. Uh, I have no problems in my head. In fact, it feels kind of good to be like I don't have to wrestle with that." Now thing. that I've accepted, now it, that I'm I've free. accepted it, I'm free, right? And so the problem with that is then you really don't really want to be delivered from it. You, it has control over you, and you serve that thing, which is your flesh. That's why the Bible does say those who put their minds on the flesh live according to the flesh. Those who put their minds on the spirit live according to the spirit so i would say it's okay to wrestle and to be like i am not good with it. it's just the fact that you ask the question probably means that you want to change or that you're wrestling with the idea the the problem is is when you make excuses and i've seen a lot of people go well you know i would i would read the bible but like i can't read i'm in dyslexic or something and for me i am dyslexic so when people say i don't really like reading it's not about what I like. It's about what I'm willing to sacrifice to get to know the Lord. If it was in a relationship and someone could, and you, you had to text your girlfriend it's, and you hate texting, you would probably do it and endure through that just so that because you care about that other person. So part of loving the Lord is a loyalty to that. You have to decide. It's not about my desire. It's about your desires. And, and part of the wrestling is I need to submit it in some way to what I want. And so reading, it doesn't mean that you have to be the grand wizard of reading or the master of all ceremonies and have all these letters. And it just means that you're disciplined enough. So I, I have done things, people call it cheating. I don't call it cheating. 
there's uh, there's all kinds in, in life place things that you can do to en- enhance your reading so for me as a dyslexic i will put the audio on of the bible while i'm trying to read along because my eyes start to go after a while and uh if you're prone to fall asleep at night when you read then read in the morning when you're awake and so you can just listen to the bible absorb it ask it questions like listen to it re-listen to it just have it be a part of your life i've put on proverbs or psalms just in the background while i'm cleaning you want to be as much absorbed and never m- any more in history has anyone had the ability to absorb the Bible than they did in the ancient world. They had to wait sometimes until synagogue to go there to have a, a public reading of the Bible. And then they had to memorize it and, or grandpa had to memorize it and teach it to his family. And everybody had to be like, what did they say? And had to communicate with others. And so that's what helps with the with the reading discipline of it. As far as fasting is concerned, I think it's worth someone holding again holding you accountable. Fast for a day. It starts small, starts simple, um, and then uh, what was the last one? It was um, uh, giving. Giving, yeah. Part of giving is really trying to be in a place where you're able to give. It has less to do with your ability to give. It has more to do with are you doing the things that God would be honored with with your resources. So you have to start with God gave granted you all of this 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 m- money however much he gives you or however much you have is it are you using it to glorify him in some way like are you spending it wisely is it organized well I think that's what helps is that once you get to that then perhaps you can get to a place where yeah I I can honestly start with giving or whatever and, and I will say too if you know if you really desire to give and you feel as though you're tapped out your paycheck to paycheck um and you have more more month left at the end of your month than you do money part of it is looking at areas in your life possibly where you could give like you know time it's like but no i mean i think financially? financially like you know i will say a lot of people maybe not everybody but a lot of people say i can't really give because i don't have the finances to do so but I go to Starbucks, you know, two or three times a week, or I go out to eat three times a week, you know, or, you know, I have these subscriptions for my TV apps and all this stuff. Um, And so part of it is to go, okay, I don't have enough money really to give right now. So here's what I'm going to do. Instead of going to Starbucks three times a week, I'm going to go once a week. And then I'm going to take those other two and dedicate it to giving and then i'm going to cancel one or two of my you know app subscriptions that i'm paying for every month and i'm going to give that and then i'm going to instead of going out to eat three times a week i'm going to go out to eat one time a week or two times a week and start with that and then just pull that money and start giving that um and and then you might find yourself opening up areas because again Sometimes when you start saying no to yourself, it gives you the opportunity to start saying yes to other things. And so, again, you know, some people might be in a situation where they just cannot, you know. But um, but I think, you know, sometimes look at your finances and look for areas that maybe I can cut back a little here and start giving where if you really want to start giving. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and like I said, I don't think you can do it alone. So I would recommend that you get around your brothers and sisters and let them hold you accountable. Let someone be close enough to someone to where they can really truly speak truth into your life, which is nice because the next series that we're getting into is going to be about friendships and finding people. And so I'll uh, stick around, listen to that series, see if it doesn't help you get connected and maybe uh, allows us to grow because I don't think we can do it on our own. I know I couldn't. <laughs> but I will say, you know, um, you know, just I, we don't know you and uh, and we don't know your situation at all. But yeah. but it is encouraging that you're wrestling with these thoughts yeah. and your and your desires are in the right in the right place. And part of that is matching our desires with with the actions that we want, um, because if we don't do that, we're not going to grow. And and I do think that it's important in every aspect of our faith to not become complacent, but always have an, a desire to grow in every area of um, of our our spiritual life. So, but thank you for those questions. Yeah, that's a good question. Let us know how it goes. All right, and I guess that's it. Is that it? I guess so. Yeah. We just had the two two questions. So, 
that's it. So again, if you guys have any questions, if you have any feedback from uh, from the topics today and you want to um, get more clarification or, or anything, just send us those questions or comments to rabbittrail at obcc.church. Rabbittrail at obcc.church. Yeah, thank you guys for watching, and I hope to see you next week. All right. Boom chuckle Bye. <laughs>